uh, Tim Kaine, I get to talk to you quite often, but not often in front of such an auspicious audience as the community that's been created by the 92nd Street Y. And I will tell you that they are celebrating their 150th anniversary. This is one of their, I think, marquee events in recognizing it. And I'm just excited to be with you for what I think is a really important conversation around uh, I, I, uh, probably hands down the best book I've read this year mm -hmm. and uh, something that really impacted me as I was reading these pages. Well, Corey, thank you. It is great to be with you. You're such a good friend in the Senate and beyond. And to be together uh, during this 150th year celebration for the Y makes it extra special. So I'm looking forward to our, our talk today. Now, now the book is not a politic. You read this and you almost forget you're reading a book by a politician. You almost feel like uh, you're reading a book by, in some way, that a, a person that is a pastor to the heart of a nation mm -hmm. through experiences of of a man who's taken a very unusual journey, especially for a United States senator. Um, and I just want to start with uh, why you, you you thread so many seamlessly weave together so many streams of the human heart and our public experience, as well as sort of private meditation. Why write this book? Why go on this journey? Um, Corey, thanks. I you know I think it was a little bit of a of an aging uh, reflection that got me started on it. I was running for re-election to the Senate in 2018. And that year I turned 60 and I like to mark milestones, but with the campaign, it wasn't a good year to mark the milestone. So I decided during the campaign next year um, is my 25th year in public life. And I'm going to do a combination commemoration of turning 60 and being in public life for 25 years. What will I do? I said, well, I'll figure it out after the campaign. Um, shortly after I won my election in November 2018, this idea just occurred to me. And uh, it's it, at actually 92nd Street, why folks might know this, there's a, a big quest in New York called the 46ers to climb all of the 46 peaks in the Adirondacks higher than 4,000 feet. And I've done a couple of them with a sister and brother-in-law. And so I thought, why don't I create the Virginia version of this, do it and write about it. And it will be a love letter to my Commonwealth. And, and we, as soon as. Oh, I was going to say, which I, I want to really emphasize this because uh, you know, some people might think it's frivolous for a politician to spend so many weeks doing this, but in many ways, as a guy who represents a state, um, for my observance, this was one of the greatest tributes you can do to not just Virginia, Virginia history, but to Virginians as well. Yeah, it's true, Corey, because uh, one thing I can say about Virginians, Democrat, Republican, independent, or uninterested we all love the outdoors. I mean, everyone has a sunset, a trail, a beach, a lake, a river, um, you know, a farm that they love and they want their kids and grandkids to have access to it. So I decided, well, the Virginia quest would be to hike the whole Appalachian Trail in Virginia, 560 miles. One quarter of the trail is in Virginia. It goes through 14 states, but 560 miles. Then uh, bicycle on the Blue Ridge Parkway and Skyline Drive about 320 miles from the North Carolina border to a town called Front Royal, where the Skyline Drive starts. And then the last one is to canoe the whole James River, which starts in the mountains way up near West Virginia and goes all the way into the Chesapeake Bay. So I decided I don't think anybody's ever done these three things. And so I'm going to just over the course of a couple of years during weekends and Senate recess weeks, as you know, during recess weeks, we travel around our state. We talk to people, but we usually are traveling by car. I just decided I'm going to people power it. I'm going to talk to people along the way, but not in a formal or scripted way. Just who do I run into? And it now, took I, me about 30 months, but it, it was an amazing journey. Well, I, again, I, you're, you're downplaying the physical test of it all. And I think, again, I'm not, I have not gone to any of these. I haven't even run a marathon or anything like that. But this is an extraordinarily tough physical challenge. It is dangerous. Uh, you had bear encounters. You yeah. had, you, you know, biking in weather that's unimaginable. You had times in the river that even like authorities looked at you like, uh, I need to be around to fish you out because I don't yeah. want you to make it. And, and you yourself had penetrating doubt about this. And then I love this section, right? When you're starting the physical challenge of hiking is exceeded only by the mental challenge. 
since I'm not in a race, the reality of pain and age uh, can be overcome by hiking slowly. But my realization yesterday uh, was tough. You started talking about all the voices in your head. Is this really a good idea? Am I not sure that I, I'm not sure I can do the whole trail? And why do I need to do the whole trail anyway? Uh, why don't I just do a series of hikes? It, you're, you're, you had to battle the physical pain as well as those mental voices of doubt. But the beauty of this book is you sort of weave this idea of doubt and second guessing even beyond your physical trial yeah. to all of us as Americans who are feeling times of doubt right now to the larger public experience we're in and these voices in our head. It, it, there were so many connections between the challenges of the journey and the challenges of life in America right now. Doubt, um, doubt about am I am I doing what I need to do to be a value in the Senate, or is there something else that I should do to be a value? And yeah, the doubts about this trip, the the hiking portion was the longest and probably physically the diff most difficult. It was forty two days to hike five hundred and sixty miles, and it was most of it was during the heat of a record breaking summer where it was not only horribly hot carrying my thirty plus pound pack, but water was gone. You know you. You plan on, I'm going to get to this water stop in two miles, and man, do I really need to fill up the water? And you get there, and it's completely dry. And then, okay, now what do I do? Um, it was probably not until about day 30 of the 42 where I finally realized, I think I am going to finish this. I mean, every day for the first 30 days, it was like, you know, day, day hikes are fine. Why, why be type A about it, you know? Um, but, uh, yeah, once I got to about day 30, I powered through the bike trip was only eight days with some friends. The canoe trip was 26 days and it was challenging in a very different way because it, it just posed some dangers that I hadn't dealt with before. But, um, you know, facing your fears, I think I say at some point um, there's a line of Kafka's that I love. There exists the possibility of perfect happiness to know the indestructible within oneself, yet not strive after it. Um, I kind of felt like by the end of the hike, I kind of knew what Kafka meant. He was hardly a happiness expert, by the way, but there's the Kafka lesson for happiness to know that resilient core that you have and, and not need to strive after it, but just to kind of know that it will be there, not to enable you to master or succeed at every challenge, but to enable you to face every challenge without fear. And and again, I, I, I just want to, like, for folks, I, I really can't recommend this book enough. Best book by far that I've read this year. And But you faced, you know, like spiders and bears and your your willingness to just let go. You, you're so desperate for water. You don't have time to wait for your yeah. sanitation tablets to, to take effect. You just risk it and throw water down. Uh, you're sleeping in conditions with, you know, mice running over you. And, <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, it, it, it just really was a journey. And I'm wondering, you conquered something along the way, um, a, a belief that you discovered, as you said, this, this part of you that is indestructible, that can do things beyond your imagination. There's something that had to must have been liberating uh, for you in all of that. And I still remember seeing you on the Senate floor. I, I It seriously looked like you, you had dropped like 30 pounds. You looked... Yeah like a, a new human being, but yet you radiated a bit of a glow, I think, when you came back from that first hike. Tell me about that. Um, Corey, I, I certainly felt that. You're right. I, I found something in myself that I, I suspected was there, I hoped was there, but it does give me a real sense of calm in dealing with challenges. I had a comical experience, you know, after the trip was done where I, I needed to drive one day to D.C. for a voting rights meeting in January of 2022. Now the trip is, you know, two months in the rearview mirror. I get in my car. I, I live a hundred miles from DC. It's a normally a two hour drive. There's it's snowing. I get on the interstate. It says proceed with caution. I know how to drive in the snow. I proceeded with caution, but I ended up stuck for 27 hours. The temperature was 18 degrees. I had a third of a tank of gas. I had one orange and about, and one Dr. Pepper in the car with me. But you know what? I had no doubt that I can make this, you know, you, you had to figure out, okay, with a third of the tank of gas and it's 18 degrees and it's the middle of the night, run the engine for five minutes, shut it off, try to sleep. When I get so cold that I'm chattering and I wake up another five minutes, I, but I, I never worried. I, I was in this situation 
thousands of us were stuck on I-95 for this 27 hour stretch, I was as calm as could be. And I, I'm not sure I would have been had I not just had this experience of kind of tackling this big nature challenge. And the other thing you, you noted a glow being outdoors. I mean, we need to connect more to the outdoors. There's a phrase that has become popular nature deficit disorder um, that we don't connect as much. We, we, you know, we rely on our screens too much. You, as you know, we walk in the Senate rooms and we're always, everybody's always looking at their screen. Um, but that connection outdoors is, is what really gives me a boost. And in fact, I don't think I have been in the Senate gym once since I got off the Appalachian Trail. I used to work out in the Senate gym a few times a week. Um, now I do all my working out outdoors. You know, there's no such thing as bad weather, only bad clothes. So, <laughs> And then it, it almost opens your eyes. Um, you, you have a, this term in there that I want you to explain to people. You call it joy shocks. Yeah. What are joy shocks? Joy shocks are you're, you're walking along and it is a it is a rainy, soggy day where everything is gray and fog is gray in May. And you look down on a log and there is the most fiery orange mushroom that has just sprouted out of the log within the last day or two or a snake sunning across a trail or you round a corner and see a vista you've never seen. Or here's one. Um, sturgeon have made a big comeback in the James River, and I was canoeing below Richmond when the sturgeon were spawning. And what they do is males jump out of the water like they're marlin coming out of the water. And these are six or eight feet long, and they smack down right next to your canoe. And, you know, the things that we rush by too often, um, you just have the ability to, you know, really see them and, and enjoy them bird songs. Um, the sound that leaves make in the fall, you know, when, when leaves are falling and they hit other leaves that are still on the trees, there's this kind of click, 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 click noise that leaves make as they fall. And I, I just had sort of cut myself off from that in, in too uh, many parts of my life. And now I'm really embracing it and finding that it's both healthy, but even more than that, it's mentally and spiritually healthy. And And, you know, it is so different than those of us now who can't go 15 minutes without looking at devices who are so isolated from nature. There's a lot of studies have done about the mental health that comes from just taking a walk in the woods, connecting to nature. I, I this short poem uh, by Warren Cooney, who William Warren, Warren Cooney uh, in the Harlem Renaissance, he mm -hmm. writes, she does not know her beauty. She thinks her body her brown body has no glory. If she could dance naked under palm trees and see her image in the river, she would know. Mm. But there are no palm trees on the street and dishwater gives back no images. Wow. Wow. And 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 you take this journey where you talk about uh, healing. And I'm wondering, um, you were processing something that few senators ever could Um when Secretary Clinton said to you, there are other people that might be a better political pick, but I'm picking you to be my vice presidential nominee because I think you would make the best president. And you go from that exaltation in an election that I at least was convinced she would win. Mm -hmm. And you journey with her and you see her grace you see her in the moments where America didn't see her, her caring. Yeah, sadly. For, you know, and you 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 commit yourself. I, I remember talking to you during those days and, and feeling this sense of hope. For me, having got to know both of you personally, it was for me a moment where I thought good guys, nice people are going to win and and people of virtue are going to ascend to an office almost in ways of old that we imagined. And then suddenly the world comes crashing down, not just in you personally, but to have to confront how our country whiplashed into a time of yeah. a different set of virtues, bombacity and braggadociousness, things that are very counter to the man that I know how did this journey help you confront some of that and understand it more? 
Corey, it was, um, I didn't, when I thought about it, I wasn't think I need to do something to process 2016, but clearly that was what my still small voice was urging me to do. And I, I use a camping analogy. There are days when you wake up and you carefully take all your stuff down and you carefully put it in your pack. But then there's also days when you wake up and it's snowed or rained during the night and everything's wet and you just shove everything in your pack and just start walking. And I felt like after 2016, the only way I knew how to deal with the feelings of disappointment was just to shove every emotion in the pack and just start walking. And I kind of realized that this trip was, was sort of the process of, okay, now take this, take it out, air it out, put it through the washer, fold it, put it away. I, I really was sorting through a tangle of emotions that I had, I think in a coping mechanism that was okay. I just said, well, let me just go to work. Let me just go to work and I'll figure it out later. And um, that, that it was therapeutic. Um, now, it was also therapeutic, not just because of the past, but as, as you know, during my trip, I mean, two impeachment trials, an attack on the Capitol, COVID, and I, I'm dealing with long COVID symptoms, the murder of George Floyd, racial protests in my hometown of Richmond and all over the country, the contested presidential election. So much happened during those 30 months, but I was able to kind of get some perspective on the existing events and then even find some motivations for my future public service. And I, I you know, that's what's astonishing about the book is you almost sort of um, re-exposed me to those moments that, as you said, and you sort of as a center you have a front aligned to, but all of us as a society have been lurching through these difficulties. And then when I added into your, you know, you were first elected in 94. So this is your 30th anniversary. Yep. This trip started around your 25th anniversary, but your whole career has been marked by Virginia Tech shooting uh, when you were yeah. governor, I, I mean, these moments of history that gutted us all. And you said it in those moments, just like that metaphor so powerfully delivered in the book about you just shove the stuff, the rainy, wet, dirty stuff, you shove it in your bag because you got to forge on. Yeah. And, and you even got this beautiful moment with John McCain where yeah. he said, you and I are the only people in the Senate that really knows what this feel. And he told you, throw yourself in the work. But now you slow down, you pull the stuff out slowly, and you come to some really profound ideas about, in some ways, the smallness of each of us as individuals, yet in some ways, the largeness that, that we can still have through just walking our path. It is... Um... On the, on the days where you can't find anything to be hopeful about, I would use Samuel Beckett. I must go on. I can't go on. I'll go on, which is a beautiful Beckett. There's not a lot of hope in that, but there still is just power ahead. But I, but I eventually, um, and you know, Corey, one of the things I so admire about you, you're a very spiritual person and I am too. I remember one day I'm hiking in the fall in, in October of, 2019, and the House is about to start the impeachment in inquiry that is going to lead to the first impeachment trial of President Trump. And it's clear this is going to land in the Senate fairly soon. And I'm walking by myself on this very hard day to climb Virginia's highest peak, Mount Rogers, and it's raining and it's foggy. And I'm just thinking, like, I, I don't want to just forge on without hope. Like, how do I understand this moment? And look, I thought back to a story that has inspired people for 2,500 years, the book of Job. And the, the great thing about the book, it's an allegory about a person, but you can also connect it to a society, is, you know, why does suffering happen? So Job has everything. He's a great guy. He starts to lose everything. So he believes maybe the universe is pointless. The neighbors who are his, quote, friends, look at him and say, well, we thought Job was a good guy, but if he's losing this, he must have done something bad we don't know about. It's a punishment for things he did wrong. So, okay, there's two interpretations of suffering. It's just the pointless, random nature of the universe, or you suffer because you're to blame for something. The reader of the story knows that it's neither of those things. Job's being tested. You know, the, it's a cruel test. It's kind of hard to admire a creator that would put somebody through this, but it's a great allegory. The creator and the devil decide, you know, Job is a good guy. And, the, and Satan says, yeah, but he's only good because he has a lot. If he loses that, he won't be so faithful. 
all right, let's try it and see. Job is furious. Job is, is distraught. Job loses everything. Job argues with God, but he doesn't let go of his principles. And so I started to think about that. Okay, put that in the context of America circa 2019. Are we going to remain true to principles? Do we believe in religious freedom or is it okay to have a Muslim ban and kick people around because of their religion? Do we believe in a free press or are we going to scrap that? Do we believe in the equality of all or are we going to take women's reproductive freedoms away? And so we have a set of beliefs as a nation. Um, I think our beliefs are solid. Our capacity to live by them is always questionable. But I just sort of felt like, well, maybe that's how I need to understand this moment in life. It's a test. And, you know, I, I would say here it is 2024. I believe we're surviving the test, but I, I don't think we're yet passing the test. But we are hopefully on a way to a place where we can say we've passed the test. And I, I've read the book of Job. I have I took a class, very Yale Law School class called the, the book of Job and the law. But the way you put it when things like this happen in the world, this binary idea, this is either because of some just the indiscriminate randomness of the world, or this is happening because we deserve it. Like uh, uh, some Christian leaders who have said the hurricane happened because of our turning away from traditional marriage. Yeah, you. It, it was sort of this powerful aha moment. This isn't happening to me, it's happening for me. This yeah. is a, ch a chance to sear away everything that's superfluous, like a hike does, where suddenly all the concerns to sear away to that next step, to to moving for am I, what is left over, what it, what it comes out in 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 that hot water that is really the pure essence of who I am, uh, am I going to rise to this moment and show that the virtues I speak to really live in my heart, and it was this you know at a time that. Um, traditional religious values in this country. The, the, the church going attendance has gone way yeah. down. Um, more Americans are, are not ascribing to any religious faith than ever before. And in the public dialogue, and you know this, Republicans have, uh, a strains of Christianity have replaced sort of the community and, the, and, and what I would think are the, the core teachings of mm -hmm. Christ with the culture wars um, but yet you seem to be a guy in the public realm that still talks about your faith, not in the exclusive exclusivity, you even talk about yeah. that Christianity, but a much more powerful, inclusive way. I'm I'm wondering, as a guy who struggled with your own faith, and I think if you're not struggling with your faith, yeah. that, that then that's a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you balance that in public life? I mean, this book, yeah, such a beautiful antidote to people who are thinking about faith and faithfulness and how to walk a faithful path, yet you do it as a public figure. Can you, can you explore that for me? Yeah, Corey, I, I think the way I've come over the years to feel about it, I was a missionary in Honduras, you know, 40 years ago, and I have a parish that I'm really involved in at Richmond. Um, faith in public life tends to be seen in the kind of polar positions of either I'm a faithful person and I, my job is to, uh, implement the dictates of my faith as the law for everyone. That's one poll. And the other poll is I'm a faithful person, but that's separated. There's a church and state separation, so I won't even talk about it. Okay. So those are two polls and they, they don't completely match up, but they line up a little bit with the way we kind of Republicans deal with faith issues. You and I know many Democrats who are deeply religious, but often they feel like that's separate from the public realm and don't talk about it. My, my view of my faith is, Hey, I should share with you, my voter, my friend, my colleague, what motivates me. Because we could talk about issues all day long, but there will be an issue that will come up tomorrow that we never thought about, and we'll have to deal with it. If you know the yardstick that I use to measure my own motivations and actions, you'll have a good sense for how I'm going to handle the issue tomorrow that we're not talking about. Um, and, and rather than just having our politics be a laundry list of policy positions, you know, share what motivates you. For, for me, it is, it is my faith. Uh, but the Jesuit educated, Catholic, Irish Catholic parents, these missionaries in Honduras, and my students who taught me so much, that is my motivation. And scripture, especially the New Testament, is my motivation. For some, their motivation is they had an experience that was scarring and they don't want anyone to ever have to go through what they went through, maybe gun violence or maybe an experience of 
poverty or or there's been an issue in their family that is giving them uh, a motivation to do something to help others similarly situated. I think sometimes we don't share enough with people what our motivations are. And so I try to share my faith story so people will get to know what motivates me, not to, not to proselytize. I'm not asking you to be like me. I do think that if I share my motivation, I may help you along your faith journey. I'm a better Catholic because of some of my Jewish friends. And I hope that some of my Muslim friends might be slightly better in their faith because of, you know, the way I try to kind of wear my motivations on my sleeve. And I think we all can do that for each other. You know, it's a, a journey like on the trail. That's one kind of journey. But we're all on a spiritual journey and we're all on a on a learning journey. And, and you know, we should try to be wiser tomorrow than we are today. And the way we attain wisdom is not just through books. The way we attain wisdom is watching each other. And, it, and, and, and that to me is um, one of the things that makes me love you so much is that it's a very Abrahamic um, ideal of faith and faithfulness. And I think it's even probably larger to other spiritual faiths. It's a, my favorite line in Hebrew. One of my favorite lines is, Ki beti beti me. may my house be a house of prayer for all nations. Mm. So I think mm-hmm. we all are coming together around a common table. Abraham was said to be favored by God because he kept his tent open on all four sides, welcoming mm. strangers. And so you you walk a faithful line as a light worker in your own way that I think illuminates paths for other people. And that's what I found in this book. Um, you and I are both identified as Christians, have different faith traditions, but it was such an illuminating path for anybody that wants to live a value-centered life. And I want to read you a quote uh, and then ask you, because uh, everywhere you go, you preach the gospel, and only sometimes you use words. Yeah, you, yeah. You know, yeah. And, and there is something so spiritual that ran through this whole book, embodied to me in this quote uh, that I know you've heard. The quality of mercy is not yeah. strained. Yeah. It droppeth, droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. Mm-hmm. It is blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. You found all through this book, uh, you, whether you called it trail magic, which I hope you'll explain yeah. that, term, <laughs> even just the volunteers that maintain the yeah. trail, to, to your encounters, that encounter with the waitress. I always say somebody who's nice to you. Yeah. Mean to the waiter is not a nice person. <laughs> um, uh, could you talk about living faith, not preaching faith, and and how you encountered perhaps the greatest gestures, which is that kindness of the stranger, greeting the stranger, and how that affected your journey? Um, I, lo- I love the quality of mercy is not strained, and it reminds me of a, another beautiful bit of scripture, the Lord loveth a cheerful giver. If you can't give cheerfully, don't. And, and if you can't give cheerfully to cause A, then you can find a person B you can give cheerfully to. And so it needs to be done with a sense of cheer and joy, not just duty, not just dutiful. Um, the, the trail magic on the trail is the phrase that hikers use for just the chance interactions you have where people do you a favor that you weren't expecting. I'm hiking with my daughter and two friends on one of these 90 degree days and we are short of water, and we've been told by hikers who are passing us that the water sources are dry for the next 15 miles. We cross a dirt road high in the mountains near a place called Burke's Garden, and somebody has just driven up the dirt road to the trail and just left uh, you know, a case of bottled water there. And you know, we weren't going to make it for the next day and a half if we didn't have some break, and there, there it was. Um, and, and this would happen again and again and again. I, I'm about to fall asleep one night a, in a shelter, and I just hear some very trudging steps coming up. It's after dark, and this guy comes in, Boxcar Willie. We all have trail names. It's Boxcar Willie. He's a retired guy from Utah, and he has had a very hard day. And I'm about to go to sleep, but he goes, you don't happen to have any extra. I ran out of fuel, and I really need to make some dinner. All right, I'll rouse myself out of my sleeping liner and find my jet boil stove and help you make dinner. And then we ended up having this amazing conversation. Why would a guy who worked for the Utah wildlife department for his entire career decide in retirement, he wants to hike the Appalachian trail. I thought there's some really cool trails and mountains in Utah. I said, yeah, but I've always thought about the Appalachian trail. And one thing about it, a, a friend of mine, Charles, who hiked with me a couple of days, 
told me, this ain't a trail, it's a community. Yeah. I, w- I was thinking about it as a trail. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? He goes, well, okay, the hikers, the shuttle drivers, the people who built the shelter, the people who maintained the shelter, the people who lugged in the picnic table, everybody who's ever even hiked for two hours and taken a picture and put it out in the social media, they've created an entire community of people who kind of love the trail, even some who've never been on it. And, you know, I sometimes think human activity is, is just the excuse we create to structure our time to be together. And if I'm right about that, then the app, the creation and, and now nearly century long maintenance and continuation of the Appalachian Trail is one of the best things humankind has ever done because it has created this continuous multi-generational community of people who know this place and who get solitude and recharge in, in nature's beauty. And the, and the wisdom that you so elegantly, to the point I was tearing up, uh, where you talk about connection, connection in nature, the cycles of rivers, uh, it, it just made yeah. me think of all of us as droplets together, all, all flowing on a, the same journey, whether we realize it or not, um, into this sort of uh, very spiritual circles you talk about in the book yeah. of it. And to, to it made me think of the monarch butterfly who I had this weird realization just months ago, which I didn't, I always thought they not get south and then they come back, but mm-hmm. they actually die along the journey. It's, it takes, it's a generation mm-hmm. down and mm-hmm. a generational journey back. Wow. All connected as a species, which we are. And I, I guess I, one of the th- the two things, and we don't have much more time, but the two things that I wanted to touch on, one maybe I'll touch on, and one I'll ask you is, one is the intentionality in which you realize the power of community and, and appreciating and recognizing whether it's how important it is to create circles of friends and family, whether it is recognizing that you're a part of a community that even if you can't see, I am here because of the sacrifices yeah of those who, who who built this trail before, who lugged it, yep. deep debates. But the powerful thing for me um, that this book really spoke to me as an African-American uh, who came to the Senate as the only one in the Democratic caucus mm-hmm. and having days where I just felt like our community wasn't represented, wasn't understood, even some painful memories of people within my own party, um, and yet you, through this book and through our friendship, have shown me this deep humility and reverence um, that you that you are a listener, that you see the mutual dignity. You, you, you humble yourself um, before uh, a communities. And this book, whether you intended it or not, is this love letter to Native Americans and to African Americans in a way I didn't expect. And that really moved me. And I have to say, as a, as a Black guy who has degrees in history, you taught me so much. And, and it's from the very start, I think I told you this when I first started reading it mm-hmm. about, um, about John Brown to the very yeah. end um, at, at the fort, uh, Monroe, it, it is, and I don't, it's so, it's not over your head. You're not, it, it's this marble throughout it is, is the story of Native Americans and the story of African Americans. It's so powerful. Can you speak well, to me about that? Yeah, Corey, it, it's it's something I loved about the book. Virginia has such history and 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 scar tissue. Um, I started my hike in Harper's Ferry, where John Brown, you know, lit the spark to start what became the Civil War. The Harper's Ferry is also the headquarters of the Appalachian Trail. I finished at Fort Monroe in Chesapeake Bay, where English landed in 1607, and the first Africans came into the English colonies enslaved Africans in 1619. And all along the way, I mean, I'm, I, I'm walking along the trail and I see ruins of little cabins, stone cabins near me. And it was a freedman's community called Brown Mountain Creek in Amherst County, um, where freedmen after the Civil War tried to establish a little community in a hollow that would have seemed impossible to grow anything in, but a very beautiful spot. But then the city of Lynchburg bought that creek to dam it up for a reservoir and they were all displaced. You also go by the little homes of the white Appalachian settlers who lived in the Blue Ridge 
uh, mountains who were displaced to create Shenandoah National Park. We celebrate, well, it, public lands, isn't this great? Even the great things were usually obtained at the cost of kicking someone else off. I, On the river trip in particular, I have two instances where I'm with tribal leaders and tribes who I finally helped obtain federal recognition for them. And they have land along the James and the federal recognition is enabling them to save their ancestral homes or, or begin to interpret their history so that people can learn about them now hundreds of years, you know, later. And th- th- there's just, you know, it was a Faulkner that said, you know, the, the past isn't dead. It's not even past. I mean, you, right. you just feel like it's a continuous present. I mean, Yesterday is present and tomorrow is present. And we, we can learn and appreciate one another more and more each day. But the more we learn, the more we know we have a lot more to learn. And I, and I, I, feel, that, I feel that about race. And, of course, Virginia's scar tissue on race, English slavery began here. Our General Assembly created the institutions that became American slavery. And American slavery, very different than England. I got in trouble once on the Senate floor by saying, you know, we didn't inherit it. We had to create it. And people got mad at me. Well, oh, there's slavery in the Bible. There's slavery around the world. That's true. But when the English came to Virginia in 1607, there was no slavery in England. There was no statute. There was no court case. Um, they came under a charter, the Virginia Company. The charter did not have anything about slavery. Everything about slavery that was done here was essentially pioneered by these colonial legislatures. And Corey, you know, the tragedy is they had to change English common law to do it. In fact, I, I call it almost the first stirrings of American independence were the decisions in Virginia to change the law. English common law was you inherit the status of your father. So if your father is a plantation owner and rapes an enslaved person on the plantation, that child would be an English person under English common law. But Virginia in the 1660s decided, wait a minute that ain't going to work out for us. We would rather change and have American law be our law be that you inherit status from your mother so that a child born to a plantation and owner and an enslaved woman will be enslaved and all their ancestors will be enslaved. And I won't have a, an obligation as a parent to maintain this child. Instead, I'll have property in this child. And so these are painful, painful stories that are Virginia stories that are American stories. Some don't like telling stories like that because it makes them feel ashamed, but we need to know it and we need to celebrate that we can, we can move out of it and move past it. And tragedy doesn't have to be the end of the story. Often tragedy is, is throughout the story, but it doesn't have to be the end of the story. And, and I just love the way you write these things. You weave them into the larger narrative and elegant, instructional. I, again, I learned important American history in it, but it spoke something without you hitting this nail bluntly on the head. You really speak to this current moment where many people are trying to whitewash American history or not teach it anymore. The value it brings to this larger story you're telling, I think brings pride and a sense of reconciliation. And you even talk about some stories of reconciliation in it. Um, I'm just wondering, can you hit that nail for me? It's just such a beautiful, elegant way to tell our history in its plain, wretched truth sometimes. But in some ways, it left the reader, it left me feeling a more of a sense of pride about who we are in our American family. Corey, you know, we're, we're on a journey again. You know, it, boy, how, how depressing it would be if you and I woke up one day and said, you know, humankind is not going to progress any more than where we are right now. So to look at things that happened in the past and find them wanting, it's not, that's not a bad thing. But, you know, we progressed beyond. And I hope my grandkids look back at some things that you and I do and say, wow, how could they have missed this? They, they, they should have done more. You know, that's how that's that's how we you know, we, sh- we should be thinking of our of our journey, spiritual journey, our personal journey, but also our journey as a as a nation is, you know, that toward more perfect, that, that funny phrase that is uh, uh, an untruism. And yet we know exactly what it means that e- even if the puffed up people of the day think we're perfect, we know that that's not true. And we know people tomorrow will wake up and, and see something we didn't see and do something we didn't do. Look at the, 
Look at the movement for LGBTQ equality in the last 25 years and marriage equality from unpopular to, you know, a fact to now overwhelmingly popular. And I don't know, would, would you have predicted that it would have moved that far that fast? And what are we missing today that our kids are going to wake up and say, wow, how come they didn't do that? So this is the journey that we're on. R race is a, is a central theme to the American journey. It's kind of our original sin that our, you know, that our founding architect said equality should be the cardinal virtue, but couldn't live by it. Okay, high-minded ideals, but human imperfection. You can go back to you know the book of Genesis, and that theme is there. I mean, it's part of who we are as human beings. And you had this great, I tell you, this great page. I want to rip it out about how you learned how to talk to young people by by positioning them where you were born and how much is how much um, yeah. nihilism and cynicism and feeling like the older generation didn't get it really a point that you that, that re reflected this point. And, and then you talk to them about how even through all of that, by staying active, by staying engaged, you all were able to make changes that you almost didn't think were possible. And I'll tell you, I, I've, I'm almost sort of out of time. Mm. I, I just want people to look for that moment where you sort of talk about youth. It's just such a powerful, there's so many moments like that in the book I had to stop and, and, uh, and, and just reflect, but there's there's two more things I want to hit really quick. One, yep. I just have to say, this is a love letter to Virginia. It is a celebration of human virtue, of kindness. It is a celebration of nature and connecting to nature. But I also came away from this book thinking it was a celebration of romantic love and a, a, a and and the connection you have to this woman who I've you know known, but yeah. never realized how extraordinary your wife is. And the arc of the, the journey with her, from the death of her parents to the starts of yeah. your relationship, to how nature was a thread that has run through who the two of you are when you get out there away from your phones. I just have to say that was a gift to me oh. to see that as well. Thank you, Corey. Yeah, yeah. it. Anne is a. We're, we're married forty years on November twenty fourth, and it's been a remarkable marriage uh, and friendship. And couldn't have done this journey without her. She came with me on big chunks of it. Um, but I'm I'm expecting the more adventures to come. Okay, so then my last thing, and I know we've got to run, but. Muhammad Ali said something like, um, if you're the same person you were 25 years ago, you wasted 25 years. Of yeah. Yeah. And, and wow. And, and so here is the journey that changed you. Um, and you end the book on an interesting virtue. Uh, so much of the book is about listening, listening to nature, listening to others, the power of listening. And then at the, in the very end, you're quoting um, some really great passages about um, uh, uh, Thoreau listening, but I mm -hmm. I was taken with the theme as you're wrapping it all up of humility and um, that you you go to the origins of the word yeah. groundedness, which connected you to nature. How did you change towards understanding that virtue? Um, or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe yeah. that's not one of the changes. But can you tell me that here you come to the culmination of the book and you're reconnecting it to the earth, yeah. the grounding towards humility, towards the awe of 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 not just nature, but seeing us and seeing the divinity in other people. Corey, as I as I'm writing the end of the, I guess it's the you know, epilogue or yeah, the epilogue of the book, I said, how do I summarize, you know. America during the time of this journey. And the and it's a Rorschach. So what's the word that comes up? Humbling comes up. So, okay, I want to understand about humbling. It's from a Greek root, meaning ground, grounding or grounded. And then I think about, you know what, in politics, we want to talk about American exceptionalism. We want to talk about America as the indispensable nation. We like to think, think of ourselves as indispensable. De Gaulle says, the graveyards are filled with indispensable men, but we like to think of ourselves that way. But the Bible says, he who humbles himself shall be exalted. He who exalts himself shall be humbled. That's a phrase about a personal trait. But again, if it's true about personal character, can it be untrue about social or national character? No, I think it's got to be true about social or national character. So I do a little bit of an 
incomplete meditation about what might it be for a nation, a powerful nation, to place humility as a virtue above indispensability or exceptionalism. Um, and then I also talk about the notion of, of grounding. And I said, if okay, if I were going to summarize my own trip, the word would be grounding and being more grounded because of my interactions with people. And then I closed by reflecting upon the scar that I obtained along the way from a riverside burning accident when I wasn't paying enough attention to my stove. And I look at that scar and the, the, the burn doctor said, you know, he could do something to make it less visible. And I was like, you know, making it less visible seems kind of contrary to the whole point of what I've learned. I earned it. I'll keep it. <laughs> well, I, I, Tim Kane, I, I, uh, I loved in the very beginning of the book where you talked about here you were up for national office. I've run for president. And you had this beautiful turn of phrase where you said, I, I, I realize that it's not necessarily going high. Life for me is about going deep. Yeah. And in this book, my friend, uh, you really went deep. Um, I've been told a lot about listening to the wisdom of my emotions, connecting to my feelings. I love what uh, a great black uh, female author said that people often forget what you say, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Mm -hmm. um, there is so much wisdom in the heart and the feeling, uh, things that are so much deeper than what we see on the surface of the world. Uh, you went deep. You became vulnerable in this book. You exposed yourself and your journey and growth. And I just think it is so instructive to the hearts of others and the heart of our nation where we are. This is a gift and you are a light worker. And I'm just honored that you are not just my friend, but in many ways, uh, uh, being about a decade or so older than me, you are a mentor as well. So thank you uh, for sharing this with the world and giving me a chance for this conversation in front of a, in front of a great community. Corey, I, I could not have asked anybody to read the book who could could get what I was trying to put across. Uh, you you clearly uh, are are receiving the message that I hoped I would be sending with the book, and for that I'm I'm so grateful that we could do this together. Thank you, uh, Tim Kane, my friend, and thank you, Ninety Second Street Y. Uh, uh, Happy hundred and fiftieth. Yes, as a neighbor of yours. Happy 150th. We appreciate you. We love you. And thank you for creating connection, community, and helping us share some heart today.